And because this is a people's movement that we are inaugurating today, calling for peace, not for an abstract peace, because peace cannot happen in a vacuum. This is a concrete peace that we are calling for that allows both the Ukrainian and Russian peoples to live in peace and dignity without U.S. foreign intervention imposing its agenda. For that, we need your support. For that, we need your help. For that, we need your participation. Because this is not a one-off event. This is only the beginning of a movement to fully challenge NATO and U.S. imperialism. We are honored today to welcome an esteemed group of courageous political and peace activists who have not been just in opposition to this war, but I would say have consistently been against U.S. wars and U.S. imperialism for their whole lives. <laughs> to bring us a fresh perspective on how this crisis and this war that's been imposed on all of us affects not just the people of Ukraine and Russia, but also affects the global South. We've invited an American journalist, writer, activist, who in his travels around the world has seen directly the plight, the plunder, the bloody hand of U.S. imperialism, whether it's in Ethiopia, whether it's in Haiti, Wherever he goes, Eugene per year is often the voice of reason against empire. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I, it's very spirited here, so I'm sure you all feel well today, feel good. I'm happy to be here with you. You know, it was mentioned earlier that I, I came and my colleague Kay from Breakthrough News was with me from South Carolina. We got up at four this morning. We almost didn't make it. We had to run through the Charlotte airport. We might have pushed somebody out of the way. I don't know. We said we had a lot of apologies, though. Many, many apologies. Uh, we went to great lengths not to, and I don't say that just for you to say, you know, oh, wow, how sad. But to give you a sense that, you know, for the two of us, and you should have seen us on the way over here in the car, checking our phones, looking at it, trying to watch the thing. Is we going to miss it? Are we going to make it? What's going on with the traffic? What, who, who timed these lights? Uh, all these different questions. Because we were desperate. I feel, honestly, we were desperate to be here in this room alongside you to say that it's time to take the power back, to say that we're going to save the planet, not to destroy it that we're gonna feed people, not starve them, and that we're gonna end wars, not start them. You know, I, I think it's, it's critically important to, to reinforce before I get into my other remarks. You know, exactly what Manolo said, I don't know where he went a few speakers ago, but about the importance of people power. Because I think when you look to your right, when you look to your left, when you look later to see how many people watched on the live stream, when you talk to your friends and your family and your coworkers, who when you tell them about it, say they wish they were there, those are the people you can count on in the moments of crisis when the entire media propaganda machine is turned against you. You certainly can't count on any of the politicians. That's 100% sure. Not in America, not in Europe. They all ran in the other direction. When the going gets tough, the politicians start running. Now, if we have a million people on the street, the phone at the Answer Coalition will be ringing off the hook from the politicians who want to speak. But when you have to get something started, when you know that everyone is going to say that you're the worst thing that has ever happened, you're a genocide denier, you're a Putin puppet, you're paid, you're this, you're that, the people you can count on are the people of conscience, the working and oppressed people of the world who know what is right and are willing to stand up and be counted, and that is you in this room.
and I just want to say something very particular about that because, you know, in the game of U.S. politics, the two sides are always trying to find a way to, to get one up on the other one, you know, to think, let's see what level of discontent is out here uh, in the populace, and let's see if we can play on that a little bit and we can, you know, maybe get a few votes here and there. Uh, some of us can remember, you know, in the, the Yugoslavia war, the Republicans— they became very anti-war. They were against wars. So much so that George W. Bush, when he campaigned in the year 2000, said, I'm not a nation builder. We're not going to go abroad and do all these different wars. George W. Bush. What happened next? And what's happening next week when George W. Bush is speaking with Zelensky at the George W. Bush Library? So right now, when the Republicans are saying, oh, we're against Ukraine, psh, Please. You know, Marjorie Taylor Greene, she wants to take the money going to Ukraine and send it to the southern border to kill Haitians and Guatemalans. Don't kill the white people, kill the brown people, and we'll all be fine. That's the nature of that two-faced opposition. So you can't rely on either of the major political parties in America, certainly not on the Labour Party or the Tory Party in the UK, not on the so-called socialist in Spain, not on the shameful Green Party of Germany that has turned its back on its history of opposing nuclear war that made it popular in the first place to become the most bloodthirsty warmongers in the European continent. So I'm proud to stand with you here today because I know that I can count on you and that we have each other's back and we're going to continue to grow and to build this movement. But, you know, when we look at the plight of the world today, I mean, it's amazing when you think about it. You know, we were in South Carolina, we were riding along, um, going from place to place, and the, the driver said, well, you know, at least gas prices are going down a little bit. And, you know, it made me reflect, knowing I'd be here in a few days, that, you know, from Sudan to Sri Lanka to Sao Paulo to South Carolina to the South Bronx, working class people and poor people on every corner of the globe are suffering from a massive cost of living crisis. And a cost of living crisis is not solely this war, but it's been so heavily exacerbated by the war, you can't separate it. Obviously, when we're talking about gas prices. Also, when we're talking about hunger, about famine, which has already been mentioned, the hundreds of millions of people. And those numbers, as any humanitarian agency will tell you, are always an undercount. They're always an undercount. We could have a billion people going hungry if we really get in the nooks and crannies of every place. You mentioned I was in Ethiopia. You know, you go to some of these back areas there that, you know, it's, there's not, they're, not, they're barely connected to what's going on. But there are people who are there who are starving. They probably aren't being counted. So on every corner of the globe, this is happening. And it was mentioned by Dr. Jill Stein very well that sanctions are playing such a key role in this. You know, you look at what's happening with the agricultural crisis now, and, and I, you know, not going to quote all the numbers, but you look at some of these different pieces on fertilizers especially, which is a big piece that people forget. You're talking about right now, the crisis right now, but don't forget the crisis in fertilizers affects the crops next year. So it's not just right now. It's next year, and it could be the year after that. Largest ammonia pipeline is an important part of fertilizers in the world, which runs from Russia through Europe, closed. Urea from Russia, which is a major part of fertilizer, 22% down the year, January to August. So even after the grain deal, we're still seeing it. And, you know, some of this can be replaced, and that's what a lot of the, the people criticizing this event might say, and I'm sure they're watching right now and typing it up so they can criticize me for not knowing what I'm talking about. And they say, oh, well, you know, Brazil, yeah, they used to import a lot of wheat and fertilizer from Russia, but they replaced it from Canada. Well, the reality of this is it's not simply about the issue of the crops themselves. Can I get something from here and bring it over here? It's about the way the markets work. You want to know who's having a good year this year, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, I'll tell you that, where they're trading all these, these futures and commodities for all these foods, wheat, and, uh, and the like. Because ultimately, these speculators, Wall Street extended, these speculators look at every possible crisis, every bit of volatility, and they jack up the prices. So you can get it if you can afford it. In Somalia, they can't afford it. In Sudan, they can't afford it. In Sri Lanka, they're, they're struggling to afford it. And thankfully for them, Russia has given them some of it for free and cheaply. So you've got this massive manipulation of the food markets, of the oil markets, which is going to get worse with this crazy scheme for an oil price cap in the start of December that even Citibank says sounds crazy, could introduce drastic chaos into the market. 
People who live in New York, you know what I'm talking about because you got the email from Con Ed saying your bill is guaranteed to go up 28 to 32 percent this winter. It's not just in Europe where people are going to be cold <laughs> because they can't pay. So we have this massive manipulation that's going on all because of the sanctions mainly, but also the war because they'll say, well, if it, if it turns this way, maybe Russia won't be able to do that. We're going to jack it up another $5. If it turns that way, well, maybe this isn't going to come out of some Ukrainian port. Jack it up another $15. So whatever they can do to make as much money as possible, and don't forget, 54 cents out of every dollar of inflation is going to profits. So they don't have to raise the prices, but they want to because that's how they live, the suffering of others. That's that 1%, that chart. How do they get that 1%? Because everybody else is at the bottom. It's a direct connection. So we can see the impact of this war is, is so unbelievable on almost every person, really, who's not in that 1% in almost every part of the world. And it's an amazing scenario because despite that, and despite the fact that we're on the precipice of nuclear war, you know, the International Committee of the Red Cross said that there would be catastrophic humanitarian consequences from even a limited nuclear war, whatever that is. You know, the nuclear bombs they have now, I mean, you know, was, my father, many years ago, he went to Hiroshima not that long after the bombing, and I remember he told me that it stuck with him for the rest of his life because some people had been vaporized so quickly that their shadows were burned onto the wall. And the nuclear weapons they have now are 50 times stronger than that. You drop one of those on a major city. I looked at a map, actually, of what would happen in New York City the other day. Gone. This, gone. Forget it. Nuclear winter. Crops destroyed. Water poisoned. Hundreds, maybe thousands of years before you would even be able to, to do it. Talk about sowing salt in the soil. This is a million times worse than that. But despite the fact that the, the globe is staring down the barrel of millions being turned into ash, and if you want to know how close it is, look how quickly the U.S. called Zelensky and said, whoa, about the Poland missile. And, you, and that tells you something about Zelensky and about the Ukrainian government. And I'm going to come, because to be honest with you, they had to have known what had happened. And instead of telling the truth, they went out of their way to try to create the basis by which Article 5 of NATO would be invoked, in which NATO would then go into Ukraine and fight Russia, and then we would be in a nuclear conflict. Deliberately. So despite the fact that the world is on the brink of existential nuclear crisis, catastrophe, world-ending consequences, despite the fact that tens, hundreds of millions of people are struggling to make it, 161 million people here in the United States have at least some trouble meeting their basic expenses week to week. 161 million, that number has grown by 24 million since March. And that's in the richest country of all countries. So imagine people who don't live here and how much they might be struggling. You know, in Sudan right now, they're saying, I saw a headline the other day that people are scared and hungry because not only do they, can they not afford the things they need now, but they don't know how much worse it's going to get. But despite that, we are told that we don't have the right to speak. All these internet trolls who came out had so many things to say about this event. It's so easy to talk tough online, isn't it? You know? People posting, if you want to disrupt the event at the People's Forum, here's a video on how to do it. Well, if you want to disrupt, I'm here right now and I'm ready. <laughs> when do we have the right to speak? Can the people in Congo speak? How come no one is even talking about Congo right now? War going on there. War been going on for multiple decades. Maybe as many as 10 million people died. That never really makes the front page. Never really makes the front page. Can the people who I saw when I was recently in Brazil, on the side of the road, no food to eat, no money, no heat, no shelter, when does their voice get heard? When the guy who was driving us around in South Carolina is a retired person just trying to get a little change in his pocket, driving people around, having it all eaten up by gas prices, does he have the right to speak? And who are the people who are lecturing us? They say, well, well when are you going to let the Ukrainians speak? Well, I mean, Zelensky is on TV every day. <laughs> Every organization on earth 
is breaking every rule. They say, oh, well, you can't speak virtually at the UN General Assembly except Zelensky. Oh, we're going to have a joint meeting in Congress where you can speak virtually. George Bush W Library, CBS, NBC, all of them, all day. And he's got a beautiful green screen. You've all seen it. He's a great actor. Um, so, you know, they got a whole media setup. So I don't even know what they're talking about, but it's a little bit more pernicious than that. Because what do they really mean when they say you're not letting the Ukrainians speak? What they really mean is you're not letting the right Ukrainians speak. Because they don't want you to know that Zelensky banned every opposition political party. All the media was banned and put under one military command so you can only hear what they want you to hear. So they don't want those Ukrainians to speak. You know, they certainly don't want the trade unions to speak. You know, they banned the right to strike in Ukraine. At the same time, they took down the trade union laws to make it easier to exploit the workers and to sell the land to Europeans. I remember reading an article at the end of last year, and it was talking about this issue of the food crisis and whether or not Ukrainian farmers were going to be able to, you know, harvest their crops and so on and so forth. It was a Reuters article. And the guy that was quoted in the Reuters article was a Dutch farmer who had come in and bought this land in Ukraine because under the past couple regimes from Poroshenko on, they've been selling off the land. They got rid of the old hangover from the Soviet era of, of, of not having that corporate agribusiness. And, you know, you can see the impact of that because some other Ukrainians they don't want to hear speak certainly are the Kananovich brothers, political prisoners who are most well known for standing up against these neoliberal laws like selling the land to the highest bidder, whether it's in the Netherlands or New York or wherever they're coming from, destroying the trade unions, impoverishing the people of Ukraine. And they have been tried as spies for daring to speak up about what's going on in their own country. So they don't want to hear from those Ukrainians either. The only Ukrainians you're allowed to hear from who are supposed to represent everyone else and get to determine what every country is allowed to do at any given time, whether you eat, whether you die, some, uh, somehow it has to come from somebody affiliated with this war drive, and that's considered legitimate. So it's not about letting Ukrainians speak. It's not about self-determination. It's about promoting war. And it's about keeping dissenting voices from entering into the conversation. I mean, how many people even know there are Ukrainians against the war? Basically, no one. Basically, no one. So I think we have reached a, a, a really an unbelievable precipice here where we must act. And I think this is an extraordinarily important event. I think we'll all look back on it and think about how important it is. You know, you never really know exactly where you are in the stage of history. But I can say when you do something tough, I mean, many of us can remember we were standing up for Libya. Everyone said, you're crazy. And now everyone says, what a disaster. When we first stood up for Iraq, they said, well, you're paid by Saddam Hussein. And now they say, what a disaster. So it's always later that everybody comes along and says, yeah, you were right. But in the moments where it was tough to stand up, that is what kicked off the ability of other people who were understandably fearful of the onslaught on your reputation, your job, everything against you if you stand up against the war machine. And it takes other people to stand up and create the space for others to feel that they have strength, that they have power, that definitely they're not crazy, and ultimately that they are not alone. So I just want to encourage, end by encouraging you to continue to stand up and continue to raise your voices. Don't be cowed. Don't be lectured by these warmongers. I certainly will not be. I'm not going to be lectured by people who would rather lift up the legacy of Nazi murderers than the legacy of the millions of Ukrainians who bravely fought to defeat the Nazi war machine. And I am absolutely not going to be lectured by the people who beat African students so they could ride their Jim Crow trains all the way into exile in Western Europe. And let's spare a word for the people who want to talk constantly about refugees. Every app I have said, do you want to donate to refugees? And I'm all for donating for refugees. I hope they're all living as well as they can coming from Ukraine. I'm all for that. But what about the refugees dying by the thousands in the Mediterranean Sea? Because all the people who say we love Ukraine, all these governments in Europe who say we love Ukraine, also say do everything possible to kill those Africans. 
They even say, let's pay other countries to torture them. Have you seen what they do to Africans in Libya now? Have you seen what they used to give them jobs, money, and education? Now they're torturing them in dark chambers with electricity and everything else you could think of. So don't be lectured by those people. Don't be cowed by those people. Don't be pushed back by those people. You are right. They are wrong. Peace is our imperative. Peace is our challenge. There's a lot we're going to have to do to continue to push past this. You know, I, I, you, I don't know. This is maybe a shameless plug. But uh, the work we do at Breakthrough News and, and other, you know, uh, media outlets. <laughs> we don't just do it randomly. We don't do it because we love to be accused of being a part of international conspiracies to destroy the world. You know, we, we do it because knowledge is power. You know, a book can be more powerful than a grenade if you use it, right? But people are deliberately starved and denied of the knowledge they need to take the action that can change the world. And we have to do everything we can, one-to-one, -one, two to two, five to five, at the dinner table, on our independent media, I, I don't even know, just screaming out in the street, whatever we have to do, because these people have billions of dollars, hundreds of television channels, and they're doing everything possible to confuse people about what's really going on right now. So this is gonna be a tough fight, a very difficult one. It's been difficult so far. I mean, anyone in here who's tried to talk about Ukraine with anybody who didn't agree with you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's not like it was easy. You had to sort through about a thousand different layers of propaganda before you even got to the real issue. But if we do it together, we can win. If we stand side by side, we can win. If we aren't afraid to go where other people say we shouldn't go and talk to people, we can win. But we have to remember that this is really and truly an existential crisis for humanity. And as, as, as Dr. Chomsky also put out, he said, I'm sorry if these words sound hyperbolic. That's the thing that they make you think you're crazy. They say, well, how could this be the case? It is the case. And it's only by people standing up and saying it as loud as we possibly can that we can turn it around. But people power has defeated every terrible institution, regime you could ever imagine. Ever imagine. I mean, you think about the odds that people have gone through. Imagine Harriet Tubman running through the swamps with dogs chasing behind her after being up for 24 hours straight trying to take somebody and get them freedom to slavery. Now, most people said to her, why do you keep going back? Why would you do this? But she never stopped. And when the country caught up with her, she didn't say, okay, cool, I'm gonna go chill. No, she enlisted in the war effort and she led Union troops back into the South to defeat the slave owners in South Carolina. It's always darkest before the dawn, and I'm honored to be able to stand here with you. I'm honored to be able to stand here with these august panelists, and I'm very much looking forward to moving from this event to the next event to the next event until we win and get rid of the threat of nuclear war, get rid of the threat of hunger and famine, get rid of unemployment, get rid of every negative thing that we see out on the streets that drives us crazy. We can do it, we can do it together, and we'll do it if we're organized and if we're ready to win. We are on the right side of history. When I say people, you say? Power. People. Power. People. Power. People. Power. People power. people power is going to end this war. And because people power doesn't stop, this event is not over yet. We have one more speaker who's going to join us. But even when this event ends, people power won't stop. Because we are already planning to be on the streets on January 14th. We are going to lead a march of thousands from right here, the People's Forum. We're going to march to Times Square. And we're going to march across the United States. We're going to join marchers across the world saying no to this imperialist war. We will not sacrifice our brothers and sisters around the world. We are honored. We are excited. We're pumped. Because 
Some speakers were not able to come because of technical questions. But we have Vijay Prashad here in person. And usually, usually if you've heard Vijay Prashad in person or even seen him on screen, there's no way you leave not wanting to move and to act and to build. Vijay, the stage is yours. Thanks. No war, but class war. No war, but class war. Only one kind of war is acceptable, class war. Isn't it great to be in the People's Forum? And to the entire staff of the People's Forum, and of course Manolo, we have to thank them. I mean, this is a beachhead in an outrageously wretched, ruling class dominated world. You have to build from here, but you have to first secure this. So always keep in mind the importance of places like the People's Forum. If we didn't have this, we couldn't have this meeting. It's really important that we build institutions. We build infrastructure. We build the place where we stand and say we're not moving. Because it's from where you stand that you can walk. So just remember this place. It's not just a place where you come occasionally. It's the beachhead of our movement. So when you leave this place, make sure to find somebody who works at the People's Forum. And despite the fact that Biden has said that the pandemic is over, maybe give them a hug. Because it is tense to have events like this, particularly when very strange elements say that they're going to come and do violence or disrupt an event. It creates neurological tension for weeks. So make sure to recognize that they're carrying this for us. No war, but class war. Last night, my daughter Rosa and I went to see the new Black Panther movie. Now, it's an incredible movie. It's one of the best made films I've seen in a long time. Three hours long. It could have gone on for six hours. I mean, it was incredible. And I was really enjoying it, especially the moment when out of the water emerges this great Mayan god who comes out onto the beach and he proposes a historical alliance between the people of Wakanda, the free African Republic, most powerful country in the world, and this undersea Mayan kingdom, which has been able to resist the Colombian depredation of the Americas. They went undersea and developed a great civilization, the two vibranium powers of Wakanda and this great Mayan empire were going to come together. And he said, we'll crush effectively the imperialists. We'll crush them. We'll destroy them. It was so exciting. I, I couldn't wait for what was going to come next. I thought this is going to be the best film ever. And then the screenwriters lost their nerve. And then the screenwriters just couldn't take it to the next level. Because at that point, you see, the interesting thing is that the CIA character in the film is a hobbit. <laughs> so, if you have the CIA character being a hobbit, it's really hard to dislike the CIA. <laughs> and he's the cute hobbit. You, you remember? 
and the director of the CIA is Elaine from Seinfeld. I mean, how could you dislike Elaine from Seinfeld? You have a hobbit and you have Elaine as the CIA. And the guy who's the US ambassador to the UN playing with his glasses is the nice guy from House of Cards. He's a nice guy. And also he sort of looks like somebody's grandfather. It's kind of clueless in the movie. So suddenly the screenwriters lose their nerve and in come the Yanks. And the Yanks are really nice people, benevolent. Because U.S. imperialism is benevolent. It's a hobbit. It's Elaine. And it's the grandpa figure. The villain must be the Mayan. So suddenly, this great Mayan king from under the, you know, under the Caribbean Sea comes up with a diabolical plan. He says to the Wakandans, I don't really care if you haven't seen the film. <laughs> I am, I am sort of, I am, I am sort of ruining it for you. But let me tell you, it's a really good film. And my synopsis is really quite irrelevant because anyway, I'm so crazy, I probably saw the wrong film. I'm interpreting the film as erroneously, as I obviously interpret reality. So, the Wakandans, he says, this great Mayan king, the Wakandans, either, they have a choice. They have actually George Bush's choice. Either you're with us or you're against us. He says to them, either you fight with us to destroy all the powers, aka the great anti-colonial alliance against imperialism, my great fantasy. I was thinking the movie is going to go again in that direction, despite The Hobbit, despite Elaine. Either you make this great anti-colonial alliance against the imperialists, or we'll attack you. Now, it's an unfortunate choice. And I very much doubt that the great Mayan kingdom from under the sea would demand this choice of their Wakandan comrades. I very much doubt this. But nonetheless, that's what the screenwriter had to do because they had to make the Mayan diabolical. Because the CIA is the Hobbit. And the Mayan has to be diabolical. So, well, obviously you know what happens. <laughs> you see, the Wakandans, who had lost the Black Panther, as you know, from the first um, film, uh, <laughs> the Wakandans could very well, at that point, have said, well, let's negotiate. Let's have a diplomatic dialogue. Let's have a discussion, a sit-down. You know, when Noam Chomsky and I were writing the book, The Withdrawal, at one point in our conversation, he said, United States is like the mafia. He said, it's like, they're like the godfather. And right through our conversation, he kept referring to the U.S. government as the godfather. If you don't like what the U.S. government says and you don't agree to do what they say, they're going to whack you. The first time Noam said that to me, they're going to whack you, I, I had to start laughing because um, at the time, Noam was, you know, the full Noam with a lot of beard and a lot of hair. Little Gandalf the wizard Noam. <laughs> And when he said, they're going to whack you, I, I started laughing. But I thought about that a lot. And of course, neither Noam Chomsky nor I um, have really, maybe he has, he, he knows everything about everything. But okay, speaking for myself, my entire understanding of the mafia comes from the movies. As you can see, most of my references are from films. <laughs> so I know The Godfather, the three films, which I love a lot. And I, of course, know... The Sopranos, which I think, you know, at least the first season was terrific, after which it sort of lost its way. And even 
in the mafia films, I say to Noam, they negotiate. They have the sit down. You know, people sit down and they talk and I, admittedly, some of them bring guns under the table and they wipe out the opposition in the middle of the so-called negotiation. But at least they have the thing called the sit down. So in the film, unlike the US government, which doesn't do the sit down, in fact, as Brian has laid out so well, does the opposite of the sit down, accelerates war. The Wakandans could have asked for a sit down. But in fact, they didn't. Instead, they allowed a possibility of negotiations to be displaced and a war to be accelerated. A war which was, which was catastrophic for both the Wakandans and for the Mayans. And meanwhile, the Hobbit and Elaine and Biden are sitting back in the United States, smiling. In fact, the Hobbit gets imprisoned, but that's a separate story. But you see, how casually imperialist propaganda works. Here we have a film, a beautiful film, with, at one level, a remarkable message about an independent people, a sovereign people on the African continent. An incredible message. The child of Lumumba. What a name to have chosen. It's an incredible story for people around the world. An independent African, not happy with the kingdom part. Not happy with the kingdom part. But, you know, let's just, for our purposes, call it a republic. An independent, sovereign republic on the African continent. And then, because you know how difficult it is to be sovereign in the Americas. If you're Cuba, for instance, you get embargoed and you get sabotaged and assassination attempts and so on. If you're Venezuela, you get an entire hybrid war strategy. So, the, the screenwriters knew that in the Americas, the only way to be sovereign is to be underwater. The only way to have a sovereign republic is deep underwater. It's a remarkable film because you have these two sovereign territories, one on the surface on the African continent, one under, underwater in the Caribbean, could make an alliance. But they can't permit that. You have to have them go to war and the benevolent imperialists can smile from the sidelines. You see, what the United States will never permit is countries to have sovereignty and to have independence and to provide a dignified life for their people. They'll never permit it. They won't permit it in films. They don't permit it in real life. Now look at it quite simply. This is not a war, really, just about Ukraine. It's not a war merely about Ukraine. I mean, I feel for all people who are in war. I've covered war. I know how ugly it is. I remember the Iraq war. I remember how ugly that war was. I remember the devastation done to Baghdad, the use of depleted uranium in Fallujah. I remember the war in Libya, a country that I've been going back to for years. The destruction of that country by NATO. I remember those wars. I saw those wars. They are ugly. All wars are terribly ugly. This war is terribly ugly. It may not be as ugly as the Iraq war, as Noam said. They are using different kinds of mechanisms. But it's ugly nonetheless. It's ugly. It's noisy. Wars are very noisy. They traumatize children. Wars are dirty. They are dusty. They destroy the landscape. It takes a lot to recover from the war, not just physically, but mentally and emotionally. People scarred for generations. In Iraq, it's going to take 50, 60 years for people to start coming to terms with the illegal U.S. war against the Iraqi people. In Vietnam, United States used ghastly chemical weapons ghastly chemical weapons. You walk up and down the central region of Vietnam 
they can't eat from that soil for generations. Wars are terrible. Wars are ugly. Nobody should be happy about war. That's why we say the only path is negotiations. Got to stop the noise. Got to stop the dust. Got to stop children being traumatized. It's as simple as that. It's not complicated. Got to do everything possible to stop the war. Which war? Which war? Is it only the war in Ukraine? Who remembers? Who remembers? And I say the word remember. Even though it's a contemporary phenomena, I say the word remember because this has been going on since the 90s. There is a war that has been going on in the Great Lakes region of Africa since the 1990s. The war against the people in the eastern section of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, once again, pressure from Western warrior states pushing Kenya, Uganda to invade Eastern DRC, to join the Rwandan illegal rebel force called M23. Where is the concern about that war? Maybe 30 million people have died in the Great Lakes War since the early 1990s. I reported the war in no northern Mozambique, in Cabo Delgado. Anybody care about that war? Nobody knows what the flag of Mozambique is like. In Cabo Delgado, people rose up because two energy companies, ExxonMobil and Total, are extracting natural gas off their coastline. They can see the rig, but it's the poorest part of Mozambique. When the people rose up in Cabo Delgado, when they rose up in Cabo Delgado, Mozambique sent its army in, couldn't defeat them. Mozambique asked for help. The French government said, we would like to intervene directly, don't want to do it. Too much bad publicity. So the French government effectively made a deal with Rwanda so that Rwandan troops entered Cabo Delgado. Silence! Silence! Africans die, nobody gives a shit. Silence! Where are those people online who are so upset that we're meeting here today? Where are they when Africans are slaughtered so that copper, coal tan, all the various components, metals and minerals that go into your smartphones, into the computers, where are they? Where is the outrage about that? Where is that outrage? Where is that anger? No war. No war but class war. No war. No war but class war. No war anywhere. Not just in Ukraine. And you know, why does this war happen even in Ukraine? Again, it's not just about Ukraine. Over the course of the last 20 years, a process of integration has been taking place. A historical process of integration that has been taking place for the first time since the ancient world. And that's the integration of Europe and Asia. Contiguous land mass. Historical integration of Eurasia. It took place partly because of the stupidities of US imperialism. Because let's face it, friends, not only is US imperialism stupid, it's also managed by incredibly mediocre people. And one of them is Antony Blinken. One of them is Antony Blinken. Antony Blinken is an extremely mediocre person. They try to build him up as some kind of intellectual of diplomacy because he speaks French. <laughs> what kind of intelligence does it take? What kind of intelligence does it take to prosecute wars? It's not an intelligent act. The United States prosecuted three wars. One against the people of Iraq, illegal. Second, against the people of Libya, catastrophic. And third, against the people of Iran, absolutely unnecessary. These three conflicts meant that Europe 
no longer had easy access to energy from Libya, Iran, and Iraq, which is why Europe became more dependent on energy from Russia. That was one part of the integration. Secondly, this bizarre political and economic system called capitalism. Bizarre. It allows a few people to take an enormous part of the social wealth and pocket it. And these people, the ones in Wall Street, the city of London, and so on, don't want to invest that money anywhere. They want to keep their trillions of dollars in illicit tax havens or in their own pet projects like buying Twitter. They're not interested in genuine investment. Europe, which used to rely on foreign direct investment coming from the United States and other places, saw after the financial crisis the disappearance of private portfolio capital from places like the United States, from Canada and so on. Except mining companies that like to domicile in the city of London, which is effectively a tax haven and secretive. So who came with investment? The Chinese, the Indians, but mainly the Chinese. Large Chinese investments in Europe, integrating Eurasia. That integration of Eurasia, my friends, is not only historical, it is also the actual process of history. Because whatever the U.S. does, it can only either delay that integration or it can damage it, but it can never stop it. It can never stop it. The integration of Eurasia is just going to happen. And the United States has to come to terms with it. But the U.S. government is refusing to come to terms with it. Now, somebody will say to me, oh, you want to sell out Europe to the Chinese and the Russians and so on. No, it's not a decision I'm going to make. This has nothing to do with me. I'm not even giving you my opinion. I haven't actually given you any opinions of mine except about Black Panther. <laughs> Everything I'm saying to you is the actual process of history. That's what happened. Integration has been taking place. It has scared the U.S. ruling class because it's meant that the European countries, which were tethered by an undersea cable in this Atlantic alliance with the United States and Canada, that Europe started to drift away from the Atlantic Ocean and move towards the Eurasian landmass into its old normal connections, which are ancient and had been blocked by the period of colonialism, blocked by the Cold War and blocked by the post-Cold War dispensation. That integration has been happening. It is inevitable. It's going to keep happening. United States, terrified by that, says that Russia must be weakened and that China must be weakened as well. If you read the national security strategy of the U.S. government, they openly say all measures must be taken to confront China, which is the leading competitor of the United States. You see, from Obama onward, there was an attempt to just talk tough with China. We're going to get you. We're going to break you. We're going to stop Huawei. We're going to prevent you from doing this, prevent you from doing that. The gangster, the godfather, the mafia. You're not going to listen to us. We're going to whack you. Nancy Pelosi, so brave. She's going to fly into Taiwan. <laughs> brave. She's going to fly into Taiwan, guys. Talk trash about Xi Jinping. Justin Trudeau talking trash about Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping comes up to him and says, hey, listen, you know, don't leak things that we talk about in private. Did you watch that clip? Yeah. Don't, don't, just don't behave like that. And then Justin Trudeau. <laughs> did, you, did, you see, did you see the way he walked off? It was sort of... Because countries like China, and they're not all countries of the left, Countries like India, countries like... They don't, they don't want to take shit anymore. They don't want to be lectured at by, you know, mediocrities. 
you know, Justin Trudeau. Who's Justin Trudeau? Black face, remember? Racist, black face. What kind of person is Justin Trudeau? Slinking away, no guts. Biden doesn't know his left from his right. Sleepwalking into nuclear Armageddon. What kind of people are these? Even Narendra Modi. You know, not a perfectly... Enough said about Narendra Modi. <laughs> and I, I have said a lot about Mr. Modi and it's got me into a lot of trouble from Mr. Modi. You know, neo-fascist leader. Even somebody like him as a foreign minister who, minister who says... Did you hear the foreign minister of India was accused, said, stop buying oil from Russia. And he said, let me just tell you some things. I've been looking into this, he said very calmly. And he said, you know, what India buys from Russia in oil in a month, he said, Europe buys in an afternoon. Think about it. I mean, effectively, the foreign minister of a neo-fascist government in India is telling the United States media, not today, colonizer. Not today, colonizer. This historical integration is just going to happen. You can't stop it. One of the reasons you need to build a massive peace movement, not only in the United States, but in all the Western warrior states, including Canada, one of the reasons to build this massive peace movement is not that you come out in support of those people out there or these people out here. It's because you have to join a global movement. The mood is changing, friends. People are not interested in this anymore. You got a handful of white politicians meeting at the NATO meeting a handful of white politicians meeting at the NATO meeting talking about global NATO. Nobody's interested in them. Nobody takes these people seriously. They are not respected. What's the name of the guy who runs NATO? Who cares? Who cares? What's the name of the current CIA head? Who cares? You know what? I don't need to know the names of these people. I want to abolish NATO. I want to abolish NATO. I want to abolish NATO. And I want to abolish the CIA. In fact, in fact, it's for me, you see, for me, I understand, you know, that there's need to change the budget and move the $1 trillion and so on. But my provisional demand is abolish the CIA. That's just the start. Abolish the CIA. What has the CIA ever done that's been good? Overthrow the government in Guatemala. Overthrow the government in Iran. Overthrow the government in Chile. Overthrow the government in Honduras. Overthrow the government in Bolivia. What has the CIA ever done that's been good? What have they done that's been good? And I even, I'm not sure that it's good for the ruling class. Unless the ruling class likes to see greater and greater instability, and unless the ruling class is actually looking forward to nuclear Armageddon. And they might be. You see, they're crazy enough. If the ruling class can be measured by the intelligence of Elon Musk, <laughs> if the ruling class can be measured by the intelligence of Elon Musk, God forbid, you know, I'm that old kind of Marxist that likes to believe the capitalist class has a rationality. And it might, as a class, have rationality. But the individual capitalists are idiots. As a class, as a class, as a class, they might have a great rationality. But as individuals, they're terrifying. No war but class war. No war, but class war. No war, but class war.
People. Power. People. Power. In the words of the VJ Prashad, <laughs> we are going to say, not today, colonizers. Not today, warmongers. Not today, ruling elites in Washington who are willing and ready to kill the planet. My friends, this rally, this demonstration is coming to an end. But our movement is being born today. Raise your hand if you're joining me in January. Keep your hand up if we're going to march in March. Keep your hand up if you believe that we are on the right side of history. Every speaker today has reminded us that we are not the crazy ones, <laughs> especially this time around. Not only are we not the crazy ones, but we're actually the majority. This is where the mass sentiment is. For those who are online and cannot see, but this room is standing room only. Hundreds of people came together today, in person, online, to say no to this proxy war. To say yes to peace. So we're excited for what's to come. Stay in tune, stay connected, stay together. Our movement is only starting. Only we can defeat the war monster. If you're online, you can text PEACE TODAY to 44321. Can we do this? Can we do this? Are we going to win? Are we going to win? Are we going to end this war? Yes. Thank you to all the speakers who've joined. Thank you to each and every one of you. Thanks to the volunteers from the Answer Coalition and from the People's Forum. You're all welcome to hang out here for the rest of the day.